Hello and welcome to Duranish. And firstly, for anyone who knows me, yes, I have gone a little crazy with hair cutting during this self isolation, um, and with <laughs> with beard trimming as well. I figured I've got plenty of time for it all to grow back. Um, although Glenda assures me at this stage in my life, there's not much chance of it growing back. But anyway, um, I have decided, I, I like probably all of you, um, struggling with um, just the time we're in with coronavirus and isolation and everything else. Uh, I've been very encouraged over the last couple of weeks to see all the positive things on social media and news and so on. Uh, on news, there hasn't been a lot of positive, but there's been some. And... I find it really encouraging to see things, for example, the, the stories uh, of the incredible uh, dedication and, and braveness of the, um, of the NHS, of other frontline staff, of carers in, in old folks' homes and things like that, of those simply working in the shops, keeping us uh, supplied and well fed. As you can tell, I haven't faded away yet throughout this isolation. So. Uh, a huge thank you to all those who are involved in these kind of things and driving, delivery driving, uh, just keeping the country going. Um, so that's been a great encouragement. It's also, also I, I get encouraged by things like humorous memes and videos that are pretty funny on Facebook. There's plenty of those around at the moment. Um, and I've also been encouraged by some sermons I've been watching and some scriptures that I've been reading from the Bible. and. What I found encouraging is, is is just hearing about all that God has done for us in the past and how that reminds us of all he can do for us in the days to come. And that's why I've decided to start this. My hope for this little video is that it will encourage you to do the same thing. That The, the inspiration for it was uh, reading um, a few days ago from a verse in Psalm 66 and verse 16 uh, and as you can see on the screen the psalm says come and hear all you who fear god and i will tell what he has done for my soul i will tell what god has done for my soul uh, and as i read that i thought wouldn't it be great if um if people all over the world christians could say, look, this is what God has done for my soul. If we could use this opportunity of self-isolation to do something really positive and share a little story about what God has done for your soul. Uh, so my hope as I do this is that after I've done this, um, that you will feel that you want to do the same thing, uh, that you will be able to, in some way, say to people, come and hear what God has done for my soul. How do you do that? It's it's very simple. These days, there's so many ways that we can go about it. Uh, for example, uh, you can simply write and share what God has done. I would encourage you if, you, if you don't want to faff about with all this technology stuff that I'm trying to do just now, uh, then simply type out Maybe limit it to 500 words or, or a couple of hundred words or something simple, even a sentence. Write down, come and hear what the Lord has done for my soul, and then write down a little story of, of just that. Uh, other ways, you can Facebook live stream what God has done. One of the inspirations, uh, as well as reading the psalm that has really got me get, just getting started in doing this this morning, is having listened to or watched a... Uh, sermon by David Mitchell from uh, Connect Church in Kirkcaldy. Um, and David was, was encouraging people to do that, to simply Facebook Live a little of what God means to them. Um, if, if you don't use Facebook Live or if you don't know how to do that, go to YouTube, make a video and then share it on Facebook or share it somewhere else of what God has done. Or of course, in its absolute simplest form, something that we can all do is tell someone what God has done, um, either face to face, if they're in your family, in your home, or uh, these days, probably more likely, pick up the phone and tell them. Uh, now, as I say that, I'm very aware that if you're anything like me, 
the last one of these is actually the most difficult. Uh, some of you know I used to be a preacher. Uh, when I was preaching, I could, I would be, I, I would have no problem in a sense. I would have a problem, but far less of a problem standing up in front of a few hundred people or 50 people or whatever. That wouldn't really phase me. Um, talking to someone one to one really would phase me. Uh, but take these little ideas and tell people what God has done for your soul in a sentence. Or if you're like me, as Glenda reminds me all the time, I'll be a little long winded probably. Uh, but there we go. Um, hopefully you'll forgive me that. So I just want to do that. I want to start the ball rolling and say to you, this is a little story of what God has done for my soul. My plan here is today to basically tell you a little about what it means when I say I am a Christian or I became a Christian. Um, I'm going to try and make it a really simple story. Um, and then maybe in future times, I'll talk about what God has done in the days between then, which is 1995 and today. Um, my story is probably not that exciting a one compared to a lot of other people's, but it's it's a real one and it's, it's what defines me. Um, so uh, I, I, w I want to start with a little disclaimer. Uh, some of you watching this will know me. Probably most of people who bother watching this will know me. Uh, and so you'll know, you'll, you'll probably look at this and think, well, pff, he calls himself a Christian. Um, the reality is I'm not a Christian because I'm a good person. That you'll be able to know by just knowing me. Uh, I'm a Christian because despite not being a good person, Jesus Christ has decided for some incredible reason that I can't comprehend that he loves me and that he's, he wants to call me one of, of his children. So here's my story. I, I remember uh, one day, a long, long time ago, uh, that I realized that, oh, I must be a Christian. I realized it wrongly at the time. Um, it was my first day as a pupil at Portree High School. And I'd been summoned to the office of the school. Now, that happened lots of times after this for all the wrong reasons. But on this particular day, it was the first day of school. I was summoned to the office and I, I had to fill out a form. can't remember what it was about. I think it was one of these things that everyone had to do. Most of the questions were easy. One of them I came across left me stumped. The question was, what religion are you? I had never thought about that before, and I had no idea what it meant. Um, but thankfully, it was a it was a multiple choice question, which makes it a lot easier for me. I like multiple choice questions. I've at least got a a one in something chance of getting it right. And as I looked through the options, I realised well, it kind of narrows down to being a Christian because uh, I looked through and thought, well, I'm pretty sure I'm not Hindu. I don't think I'm a Muslim. Uh, I didn't really know what a Buddhist was back then, so as I looked through it, I thought, well, yeah, I, I take the box of Christian. And from that day on, weirdly, I thought, well, oh, yeah, that must be what I am, a Christian. Um, and there's, there's kind of three reasons why I thought in those first 18 years of my life that I was a Christian. Um, firstly, I thought I must be a Christian because I, I grew up in a, a, a Christian country. Scotland's a Christian country, isn't it? Or that, that's what I thought at the time. Everyone's Christians in Scotland. Secondly, I thought, well, I must be a Christian because I came from a Christian or a church background. Um, I was brought up in the Free Presbyterian Church and then the Associated Presbyterian Church. My parents faithfully brought me to church every week um, or faithfully uh, dragged me to church every week, whichever way, but I'm very thankful for it now. Uh, my grandfather was a, a loved and respected elder within the church. Um, surely I must be a Christian. Uh, and thirdly, I thought I must be a Christian because I was actually a pretty good person. Surprise, surprise. Um, I, it, I was a good person in the sense that... Um, I tried to be nice to people. When I wasn't at school anyway, I tried to be nice, nice to people. People who knew me out of school um, thought of me as a nice, happy boy. At school, maybe, yeah, a little different. I was every teacher's worst nightmare. Apologies if you happen to be a teacher of mine um, watching this. 
Uh, but yeah, it was actually a pretty good person. I, I, I kept smiling whether I felt like it or not. I tried to do the right thing. I, I didn't ever get involved in anything, you know, the kind of things which people think is really bad. I wasn't into drugs or, uh, you know, I didn't kill anyone, didn't rob a bank, all of that. So there it was. I was a Christian. I ticked the box, uh, or so I thought. Other than that first day of high school, I barely thought a thing about Christianity or religion or any of that uh, until a few days before my 18th birthday. And at that time, I was studying in Solmarostig, which is a Gaelic college uh, on the Isle of Skye. Um, while I was studying there, I saw a little scrolled piece of paper taped to the notice board that said there were Bible studies every Thursday and Friday evening at 8.45. And the guy who was running those and who put the sign up was Scott Cameron, uh, who's now a minister in a church in, in Stevenson in Ayrshire. And I remember seeing those signs and I thought, you know, this is perfect. This will really earn me some brownie points uh, with mum and dad. Imagine if next time I speak to them on the phone and they ask me what I've been doing, I can say, oh, I've just been to a Bible study. Uh, and I really thought nothing of it. I didn't think it would have any dramatic effect, but little did I know that that evening and that Bible study would change my life completely. Um, so it, the, the main difference was that every week going to church, I had been sitting in a crowd of it could be a 20, 30, 40 people. And when you do that, it's very easy to switch off to what you're hearing. You can sit there with a glazed look and a smile and occasionally nod. And inside, all you're thinking is, can't wait to get out of this place, not bother listening to a word of this. And uh, I'm just, you know, what what will I do when I get home? What are we having for dinner? That sort of thing. What are we going to watch on, on TV? In a Bible study that I like the one I found that night, it's very different. I went into the room and there were three of us. There was a guy, Scott, leading the study. There's another guy, Alistair, and there was myself. And the three of us were there and suddenly you realise that you can't just glaze over and think about what you're going to do after church. You have to answer questions. You have to, you get to, you're having conversation, you're speaking and you have to listen. And when you listen, for me that night, it was as if it were the first time I ever heard what we call the gospel, literally means the good news, a story of, of God, of Jesus, and of how he came to save the world from our sin. Um, it wasn't the first time I'd heard it. Realistically, I, it had been spoken week after week in church, but it was the first time I ever let it penetrate into my into my head, and certainly God then sunk it into my heart. And I realized that this was the most important message in the world. I realized that the whole world and the whole of life is all about God and God sending, God loving me so much that he sent his son Jesus. Uh, I realized that night that I was a sinner. I realized that there was, that my life was just, it may seem good in other people's eyes, but it was far from good in God's. I realized that my life was basically lived my way without any reference to God and that that's not what God wanted. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm snookered. I'm sunk. Uh, I've been living all, all my, all my life, all my 18 years without any thought of God. But God came and said, you're not snookered. <laughs> Call on me. I will forgive your sin. I'll forgive all of that. I'll bring you to myself. And you can have a new life and walk with me. And that's what happened uh, that night. The next morning, I got up. The, the, I, what, what I don't think I mentioned is that this Bible study was on the eve of my 18th birthday. On the morning of my 18th birthday, I had been looking forward to this for so long. And I woke up and I literally, I, I got dressed, I went for breakfast. And it wasn't until I met someone in the office who said, happy birthday, that I remembered, oh yeah, it's my 18th birthday. I was so overwhelmed with the fact that God was was interested, massively interested in every part of my life. It, to me, it was like the life I'd lived before was just this, that, and the next thing, all kind of going together, but there was no great purpose in it. 
It was a little bit like a jigsaw, but with one massive piece missing from the center of it. So nothing else really fit together. And then I woke up that morning and it was like the jigsaw had been built and was complete. Not that I understood everything of it, but but uh, that that with God in place, as, as many people have, have said, and I think it was Billy Graham who coined the phrase, that every person has a God-shaped hole in their lives. Uh, and you can keep searching and searching. You'll never find your life complete until the one thing that fits a God-shaped hole, God, is is there. So uh, that that was that was then. That was uh, twenty five years ago. Um, that was when I when I when I became a Christian. Uh, ever since then, I have known God working graciously in my life and in ways that I certainly do not in the slightest deserve. Um, one of the neat things about that night, uh, to me, one of the great things, I, I have a terrible memory. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows I have an awful memory. Um, um, my wife, whatever her name is, she'll tell you that. Uh, but no, I have a terrible memory, and especially for dates. I can never remember dates. Uh, so, which makes me really glad that I became a Christian on the morning early hours of the morning, four o'clock roughly in the morning of my 18th birthday. Uh, and one, the terminology the Bible uses, or one of the one of the terms that the Bible uses to talk about people becoming Christians, starting to follow God, having God in their lives, is that they are born again. In other words, it's such a dramatic, life-altering change. It's like God has made the life of the past go away, the sins, the failures of the past, everything is blotted out and you become a new person uh, through Jesus Christ. With, with Christ in your life, he gives the Holy Spirit to live within us, to help us to live that life. So the expression is that you are born again. And, and I love to think of it like this. Uh, because it was on the same day, I can say that on the 17th of October, so now you all know when my birthday is, you can feel free to buy me presents. On the 17th of October, 1995, sorry, let me start again. On the 17th of October, 1977, I was born. On the 17th of October, 1995, I was born again. So that's my story, at least a little bit of it. As I said earlier, I may come back to this and do a, a little update on... Uh, on, on some of what God has done for me since then, which the last 25 years have been a story of me failing miserably uh, and then realizing incredibly how gracious and loving and kind and forgiving and how, how God is a God of second and third and fourth chances who pulls you back to himself. But um, he has done so much for me. Um, that's my story. My question now is, what is yours? If if you have a story of what God has done for your soul, I would encourage you to to save it. Not everyone has the same story. In fact, we, obviously, we all have different stories. Not everyone has a dramatic story. Um, mine isn't particularly dramatic. Some people they've they've grown up their whole lives loving and trusting in Jesus Christ. Some people it was a very gradual thing. Some people it was a very dramatic thing. I love the fact that God works in such a variety of ways. So, for example, a very good friend of mine, Stevie Boyle. Hi, Stevie, if you if you happen to watch this, um, I, I love it when he's sharing his testimony because we have such a different story of how we came to Christ. Uh, for Stevie, he can talk about, you know, I was I was a drug addict and uh, I was involved in this with guns and I was in jail and I was this. And, uh, I, and he's had this dramatic change from being a pretty horrendous living person uh, to God just coming into his life and making him new and a passionate evangelist for Jesus now. Uh, my life is completely different from Stevie's. I never did any of that bad stuff. I was just your regular kind of nice person, went to church. The point being that you take one extreme to the other extreme and you realize that if you're someone who's done every bad thing in the world and you've killed people and robbed banks and done drugs and all of this, it's obvious sometimes to realize you need something, you need someone, you need forgiveness, you need Jesus. 
But if you're someone like me and you've grown up in church or you've grown up, maybe not in church, but just a, a pretty good person, kind of nice person, uh, never done anything particularly dramatically wrong, I can testify to the fact that you need Jesus, I need Jesus just as much uh, as that the Stuart McKinnons need Jesus as much as the Stevie Boyles. Um, and thankfully he is God. He, he is the, the, Jesus is the one who offers that to all of us. So I would encourage you, whatever your story is, whether it's dramatic or simple, whether you share it in one sentence or whether you share it in a long-winded thing like, like this, which is far too long-winded, um, I would just encourage you uh, to use this opportunity, tell people, come and hear uh, what God has done for my soul. Um, and who knows who you could encourage and who could be blessed through this. Um, these are days when we need to encourage each other, and these are days when we need to use the opportunities given to us uh, to speak a word for Jesus. So thank you, uh, and I look forward to hearing your story.